such a full room. It's so intimidating, that announcement. Like, there it is. Hi, everyone. I know many of you. I'm Lori Lefkowitz. I'm directing the Humanity Center on an interim basis. And um, uh, I'm happy to welcome you to today's Faculty Works in Progress. As you know, um, the Faculty Works in Progress is an opportunity for us to share our ongoing research with one another, to build scholarly community, to engage our brains often in fields not exactly our own, and a special subset of the Faculty Works in Progress series, of which today is one, um, is when our Humanity Center fellows present in really a, in a kind of lightning round um, the research that they're working on in the Faculty Fellows Seminar. And today is the um, second of three. There will be one at the end of April as well. Um, so the, the um, additional um, pleasure advantage of these particular faculty works in progress presentations is that we also like to showcase what it is to be working in um, interdisciplinary collaborative scholarly community um, and to show off our residential fe uh, fellows program in the Humanity Center. So I, without further ado, I will introduce the convener of this year's um, faculty fellows, uh, Professor Régis Jean-Charles, um, who will talk a little bit about the fellowship program and introduce today's um, presenters who will serially present from this location. And one more thing, I do want to um, just promote the next um, uh, Faculty Works in Progress event will be on March 11th. March 11th, Chris Mandrapa, Mandrapa is that how we pronounce? Um, we'll be working with James, we'll speak with James Akita, his graduate student on um, Black Cambridge Port to the Future, Activating the Humanities for um, Anti-Gentrification at St. Augustine's uh, African Orthodox Church. So we are very excited to welcome him to our faculty and to have him present. So just note that on your calendars, if you would, Regine. Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. I want to say a special greeting to our very um, special, important young guest, Sankara. <laughs> thank you for being here to support your, your godmother, your auntie Layla. And we also thank your, your mother, a brilliant scholar in her own right, Dr. Sharice, I always forget your last name. Um, <laughs> but thank you for being here, Sankara knows. Um, and we welcome you into this space. Our theme is world making and world building and who better than a baby born in the, the past few months, in December actually, the last month of 2023, than to um, accompany us on our journey today. So thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce our fellows. I will only read their titles. The wonderful thing about you know, the world that we live in today is that you can look them up and read their entire <laughs> long titles. Some of them are very long. I'm not gonna name names. Some of them are very long. Um, We've been having a wonderful time together. Again, our theme for this year's world making, world building. And I like to think that we are building a little world of our own with this group. Uh, this is the second to last group actually that we'll share. So the next set of these fellows who we'll share will be on April 15th. And we're very excited to bring back what Lori began as a tradition some years ago when she was not the interim director of the Humanity Center, but the, the director of the Humanity Center. Um, is the lecture, the, the, the fellowship program culminates in a lecture at the end of the academic year or towards the end of the academic year. And the fellows actually choose the speaker and we had two highly rated speakers and we had to go with our second choice who is Saidia Hartman, um, who will be here on April 11th. And so I purposefully added that this was a second choice to let you know what we're dealing with in this group of world making fellows. Um, the first choice was Ruha. Her. The first, no, I, of course, I would never tell her. Um, the first choice, though, was Ruha Benjamin, right? Oh, wow. So, whose work, obviously, on world building, is very current right now. And personally, you know, I find Sidney Hartman's work always very relevant. Um, so, our fellows, our, our our fellows who will be presenting their work today are in order of appearance: Dr. Layla Brown, who is an assistant professor of cultural anthropology and Africana studies, and affiliate in women, gender, and sexuality studies. Her research focuses on pan-African socialist and feminist movements in Venezuela, the United States, and the broader African diaspora. 
Our second speaker will be Dr. Jonathan Kahn, Jonathan Kahn, Professor of Law and Biology, who works on biotechnology's implications for our ideas of identity, rights, and citizenship, with a particular focus on race and justice. He holds a joint appointment with the School of Law and the Department of Biology and the College of Science. And lastly, we have Jeff Lampson, who is a PhD candidate in world history and holds, oh, there you are, and holds an MA in education from the University of Pennsylvania, hurrah, hurrah. His research focuses on the history of technology as it relates to 20th century police reform in the United States and the world. Thanks everyone. Regine, one, one quick thing. I am happy to go second, but the order of the slides has Jeff. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> However, you want to I know it was too good to do. We'll go with the slides, okay? That's fine. I think everyone knows which of you. Yeah. Yeah. If not, just say your name first. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, there's lots to say, so if, when I get to the 10 minutes, somebody just tell me to be quiet and I'm, <laughs> I'm going to start a timer just. <laughs> okay. So. Thank you all to everyone for being here. And a special thank you to my little Pan-African baby, Sankara <laughs> Zolani, named at the time of Sankara. Um, so I, there's a lot of things to say about this. So this is something that I guess kind of started as, an, as a chapter in the ongoing book project. And it's something that I'm looking to sort of develop further. Um, I missed one little slide and the slide was supposed to be a slide of Andai, who's a Guyanese. Um, activists, feminists, um, all around many things. But the, there was a quote that she has that says, the way we experience the world should teach us something about how to build a movement if that's what we want to do. And so I wanted to start there because a part of the way that I approach my research is from my own background. Um, so those of you who know me know that my mother passed away when I moved here in 2018, but I also come from a family of activists, um, who are members of the All African People's Revolutionary Party, and we have recently begun cataloging all of the recordings of African Liberation Day that we have since the 70s. And this is one that, there's many, but this is one that I found with my mother speaking. So I want to start this, this presentation with her speaking. It's just about a minute and then I'll... So hopefully, here. Alt. Alt, shoot. Josefina, Sister Marilyn, and Sister Nomalanga for coming forward and taking their place as women in the struggle and playing their proper role today. Thank you. <laughs> Greetings, comrades, brothers and sisters, friends and supporters of the African Revolution, the worldwide struggle for human rights, democratic rights, national liberation, scientific socialism, dignity, and peace. On behalf of the All-African People's Revolutionary Party, permit me to once again welcome and thank all of our comrades, sister and brother organizations, international friends and supporters, and all of you, the masses of our people who have come and participated in this historic 41st anniversary observances of African Liberation Day. We would also like to express our sincerest gratitude and appreciation to the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere, the victims and survivors of a brutal, racist, genocide, settler occupation, colonialism throughout North, South, and Central America, and who are waging a heroic liberation struggle to regain possession of their land throughout this hemisphere. We thank you for your gracious hospitality. Humanitarian so I just wanted to start with that clip because one of the pieces of feedback that I got when I workshopped my piece. Um, so I had initially worked on a piece of this as um, a keynote talk for the Decolonial Philosophy Laboratory at the University of Oregon last year. And so that piece, I had kind of taken out a lot of the sort of personal elements um, of the speech. And so I wanted to 
begin here because this is the place from which I always begin with all of my work, with all of my research. It, it comes out of my experience being raised in a particular kind of ethos with a particular kind of understanding of my responsibility to the world. And I start with my mother as I think about Pan-African feminism because my mother is one of the, was one of the co-founders of the All African Women's Revolutionary Union, which was started in 1980. And so I wanted to just bring her into this space. <clears throat> Um, so what I, I always, I always try to decide if I should do this or not, but I want to give my own understanding of what, of what Pan-Africanism is based on my involvement in the all African Peoples Revolutionary Party, which is the party of Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of Ghana called for, um, called for in the wake of sort of the independence era. It was something that was initially supposed to be sort of built and developed out more on the continent, but it actually took off in the diaspora more quickly than it did on the continent. Um, so according to my understanding of Pan-Africanism, it is the total liberation and unification of Africa under an all African socialist government. And it must be the primary objective of all black revolutionaries throughout the world. It is an objective which, when achieved, will bring about the fulfillment of the aspirations of Africans and people of African descent everywhere. It will, at the same time, advance the triumph of the international socialist revolution and the onward progress towards world communism, under which every society is ordered on the principle of from each according to his or her ability to each according to his or her needs. Um, now, this is something that the reason why I start with that particular definition of Pan-Africanism is because I know there are many iterations of what people think Pan-Africanism is out in the world, and many of them I disagree with, um, but for, <laughs> I mean, I do. But for me, the one of the things that is central, one is the primacy of Africa, as this political position in the world, but two is this actual move towards a socialist um, state, right? Or as Kwame Nkrumah, one of his goals was the United States of, of Africa, right? Um, but I also want people to understand that this is not, this understanding of Pan-Africanism is not a sort of racialized, essentialist understanding of mm. Pan-Africanism, right? Um, and so Sekou Toure, who was the first president of independent Guinea, um, and was at one point in time a co-president with Kwame Nkrumah after he was ousted by a coup d'etat, um, in his sixth speech to the Pan-African Congress, and I believe that one was in Tanzania, um, said that the color of the skin, whether black, white, yellow, or brown, is no indication of the social class, ideology, code of conduct, qualities, and abilities of a person or a people. Our cultural identity and common historical destiny should be our main concern as we have all been treated unjustly by exploiting powers. And in the longer sort of iteration of this paper, I also use Sylvia Tamale's um, understanding that sitting at the bottom of the rung of the racialist construct, Black people have a common cause regardless of location, ideology, class, gender, and other life circumstances. Blackness becomes their tribe or their nationalism. The term African captures the shared heritage of African belief systems, as well as the people's shared and enduring legacies of enslavement, colonialism, racism, and neoliberalism. When the empire strikes the African other it completely disregards these nuanced diversities. Africa's decolonial and decolonization struggles must also be solidified to act as one ecosystem. And Hugo Chavez in his sort of last letter in 2013 after he died to the South-South Summit that was taking place in Equatorial Guinea made a similar comment about the linked fate of peoples of African descent um, in Africa and in, the, and in the Americas in particular. Now, my research does focus more on Venezuela, and so there are a couple of different figures that I like to bring in to sort of think about as I'm trying to think through what my own sort of um, definition or iteration of Pan-African feminism looks like. One figure is this woman, Ipolita Bolivar, who was, for lack of a better term, Simone Bolivar's wet nurse, right? She was the woman who his aristocratic family had enslaved to take care of him. Because he was from an aristocratic family, they were for the most part were gone. Um, and it was through him, Venezuela, Afro-Venezuelan people argued through lore, that it was through her that he developed his ideas about liberation and freedom having been raised by her. One of the other sort of important figures is this woman, Arheli Alaya. Arheli Alaya, like I don't really know any other way to describe her except for as an badass. Mm -hmm. um, she was. So her father was a guerrilla fighter. He was a communist. Um, she was a young teacher who at the age of 19 was raped um, mm -hmm. and was, and for, keep, for her decision to keep her child, she was fired from her job as a teacher. 
Um, and all right, she already came from a sort of political mm -hmm. active family, but this is the moment that sort of really spurred her own kinds of activism. And so her activism as an Afro-Venezuelan woman is really spurred by sort of her commitment to women's rights and liberation, but also a deep, deep, deep commitment to socialism. Um, I want to read something quickly. I know I don't have a whole lot of time from her. Um, where is it? So in 1996, she was elected president of the movement towards socialism, becoming the first um, the first woman and the first Afro-Latinx uh, to, to occupy such a high position of authority in any Venezuelan political party. Um, a party that itself developed into a serious contender, earning almost a quarter of votes in the gubernatorial elections in 1995. By virtue of her race, gender, and social status, Laya was forced to follow a path of significant resistance along which inconceivable injustice was foisted on her. Her steadfast devotion to exposing the eradication, uh, exposing and eradicating inequalities of the races and sexes rendered this path even more treacherous and her success less probable. Nonetheless, she died on November 27, 1997 as one of Venezuela's most, most influential figures. Um, so in 2014, the... So when I first started doing field work in Venezuela, there was not a lot of work written on, on Argelia Laya, but the University of Central Venezuela and the women's popular ministry, Mi Mujer, Mi Mujer um, in Venezuela, put together this edited collection of her speeches um, and thoughts. And so I just want to share this really quick. Wow, that's kind of long. Um, but she says, Venezuelan women are a very important sector of the social forces that fight for a profound transformation of the current socioeconomic political system. It is completely clear that for the exploiters and oppressors, it is a matter of life and death um, to keep the women of the political of the popular classes deceived, marginalized from politics and guided by the path of the false sexual revolution as a path towards liberation on a strictly individual level. The triple exploitation of women in the capitalist economy, in the family, and in society demands a scientific, particular, specific treatment of their, pro of their problems, a policy and a direct message that can awaken them, make them aware of their situation, and capable of rebelling against the system. There's more that I can say in the Q&A because I know I'm out of time, but I wanted to share these two women. And then the last thing I wanna share um, in light of where we are. So this particular, so when I was, when my parents were in college and my father joined the party, two of the movements that he was most actively involved with were the Palestinian Student Organization um, and the American Indian Movement. My parents had friends who were both um, associated with the Palestinian Liberation Organization and the PLFP, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestinian People. One of whom, um, one of the women who was a central figure in that movement was this woman, Leila Khaled. Um, and there is a biography of her online if you're interested in learning more about her. But she is who, she is, af I was named after her, I'm sorry. I was named after Leila and I was named after another woman, Dalai Mugrabi, who was a member of the PLO. But one of the things I find really interesting about Leila Khaled is her, her um, insistence on both being a fighter, but also being treated as a woman in the way that she understands herself as a woman, right? So she said, I have learned that a woman can be a fighter, a freedom fighter, a political activist, and she can fall in love and be loved. She can be married and, and have children and be a mother. Revolution must mean life also, every aspect of life. So I will end there. <laughs> Um, so, I'm Jeff Lamson. I'm a PhD candidate in world history. Uh, I want to start by saying thank you to everyone for being here. Thank you to the Humanities Center, and thank you especially to Regine for convening all of us. Um, but most of all, thanks to the group of fellows. Uh, I think the Regine's right that we're building our own little world, and it's been a really sort of invigorating and intellectually stimulating year for me, and any progress I've made I think is in, due, in no small part to all of you, so truly thank you. Um, I'm gonna to talk today about my dissertation, which is a uh, work in progress, and I've shared part of it with the group. It's called Engines of Authority, Patrol Cars, and Police Reform in the United States and the World, 1900 to 1980. And what I'm really trying to do with this dissertation is think about the history of police reform by writing a, a history focused on a particular technology, the police car. Um, and I understand the history of police reform as a transnational project, because it takes place in a network of police advisors, um, security forces overseas, and domestic police in the United States. And that network is one that sort of came of age at about the same time that motorized patrol became ubiquitous in American policing. 
So my interest in this project began with some skepticism regarding a narrative that was popular among police reformers in the 1970s and 1980s. And that narrative basically went like this, that when you put cops in cars, you sever them from the community. And that deteriorates the relationship between police and citizens, especially urban black citizens and other communities of color. And this leads in some cases to ineffective policing or, or worse, abusive policing. And so that was most famously articulated by James Q. Wilson and George Kelling in their 1982 Broken Windows Theory, which was popularized in this Atlantic article. And in that article, they write, quote, in theory, an officer in a squad car can observe as much as an officer on foot, but the reality of police citizen encounters is powerfully altered by the automobile. The door and the window exclude the approaching citizen. They are a barrier. Or as another criminologist put it in 1968, speaking more explicitly to the question of race relations, quote, from the front seat of a moving patrol car, street life in a typical black ghetto is perceived as an uninterrupted sequence of suspicious scenes. So Wilson, Kelling, and these other reformers were basically arguing that in their words, policing had become moribund in the 1960s and 1970s, primarily or mainly because of the patrol car. And the, that narrative seems intuitively correct, if incomplete, right? That the police car would create a physical and symbolic separation between police and citizens. But as an aspiring historian of technology, it struck me as entirely too deterministic. And so when I started looking into it, what I found is that just as these reformers in the 70s and 80s claimed that you could fix a host of problems in policing by taking cops out of cars, so too were reformers in the 1930s arguing mm. that you could fix a host of similar problems by putting cops into cars. And so those earlier reformers mm. were selling a very specific form of policing. And they argued that it was new and reformed and modernized and professionalized. Um, and they did it by selling motorized patrol. And in this dissertation, when I write about motorized patrol, I'm thinking about it as a technological system. And this is what my first chapter that I shared with the group was about. Um, and what I, mean, what I mean by a technological system is that it's not just the patrol car. It's the police car in combination with the radio, increasing emphasis on collecting crime data, new techniques for storing and analyzing that crime data, applying it to maps to identify quote unquote high crime areas and saturate them with more police, um, new bureaucratic structures, et cetera. So it's a much bigger system than just the car itself. That really does alter the administration of policing in the 1930s, but to the public, police officers and police reformers in this period, they really sell the police car as the most publicly visible piece of this system. And when they're doing so, they're selling something specific. They argue, their sales pitch, if you will, is that cop cars made the police more effective, more cost efficient, and more service oriented. So there was a, there was a a significant public relations campaign, essentially to normalize calling the cops and integrating the citizenry into this network. Um, and you can see some examples from that here, um, some of that public relations work. Now that was, this is where I sort of am trying to use the technology to understand something more about police reform, because that's how the technology was presented publicly. But internally, among police reformers at conferences and publications, in training programs, et cetera, the sales pitch, if you will, was a little bit different. The focus was on saturation. The idea was basically, and is, this was sort of uh, articulated and advocated for most, most vociferously by a guy named O.W. Wilson, who was a national police reformer in the 20th century. And the idea was essentially that the main point of policing is deterrence of crime through highly visible, dense policing, saturation of communities. Um, and he attached this idea, which he called aggressive preventative patrol, to motorized <coughs> patrol and essentially constructed them as one and the same. He wrote, good policing relied on omnipresence or the cultivation of the feeling that the police are everywhere. So he saw police cars is very important here in terms of distribution of personnel. In the work, I don't have time to talk about it at length here, but a lot of technical details about how motorized patrol would be implemented, one or two person cars, the color of them, et cetera. A lot of that, the way that it's worked out 
is in order to make motorized patrol about saturation. And so the concern in the dissertation is really with writing a more accurate history of the police car in order to unpack the relationship between reform and technology. And that fills a gap in the scholarship because very few historians have written, there's a lot of policing history, but very few have written anything that focuses on particular tools and artifacts. Um, and that's despite the fact that tools and artifacts are a massive part of our public discourse about policing. Think about the critiques of heavily armored uh, police cars, for example, or the reformist argument that body-worn cameras would solve the problem of police accountability. And I don't have a ton of time here to talk about the transnational context, so I'll just sort of say that the, the point of the transnational context is to build on this burgeoning subfield within carceral studies that understands this international network um, and thinks about domestic policing and counterinsurgency within similar analytical categories. So that's sort of the narrative background of the project. A little bit about how I'm thinking about it or how I'm approaching it. I'm really thinking about three buckets here, uh, domestic police reform, counterinsurgency and included in that is police advisors working abroad and then technology. And each one of these has its own sort of body of literature, main ideas, and then direct pertinence to motorized patrol itself. And then I'm gonna commit a presentation faux pas here and put way too many things on a slide. <laughs> um, and I do that not because I expect us to actually digest all of this or go through it all right now, but I just wanted to give you sort of a visual understanding of what I'm trying to do really is understand this network or this web of relationships by focusing on and centering a particular technology. And my argument is sort of that by doing so and focusing on the artifact, we can expose some of the inner workings of how all of these things relate to each other. As so I'll finish just giving you sort of the big picture of what it's all about. Chapters one and two are 1900 to 1930, building that technological system. Chapter two is selling it. So what I, how I was describing the public relations campaign, attaching it to saturation. Chapter three is about the role of automakers in their marketing efforts to shape the meaning of patrol cars. That, uh, that's an ad from Chevrolet there from which I take the, take the uh, title of the dissertation, Engines of Authority. Four and five, pivot to the transnational. Um, the goal there is basically to think about the way that police advisors were operating a similar way to police reformers, arguing that they were professionalizing or modernizing security forces overseas when they knew full well that by motorizing them and giving them these tools, they were expanding their capacity to surveil um, and in the worst cases to kidnap and torture and disappear citizens. And I focus there on in Vietnam, Guatemala and Argentina. And then chapter six refers, it, it focuses on those reformers in the seventies and eighties who argue for a return to foot patrol. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thanks, um, everybody. So uh, this this is my sort of just again like you know brief. It's sort of like speed dating or something. That's what I was reaching a brief, for. Brief overview of um, my project, which is at this point titled "The Uses of Diversity: Managing Race at the Intersection of Law, Politics, and Biology." Um, so the idea of this is um, looking. I mean, there's an area for that I've been looking at for a while now from a variety of angles, but the basic idea is um, considering how the concept of diversity um, has provided um, a site for the entanglement of uh, sort of socio-legal with biological constructions and understandings of race in very problematic ways. And it's tricky, right, because um, Diversity as a concept, uh, both, both just sort of as a word, but also as a concept, suffuses the language both of biomedicine and of law and politics and, you know, like DEI and all of that. Um, and so um, this concept then becomes a sort of field where entanglement of, the, of these ideas over time um, has happened, continues to happen. It's sort of like an invitation for it to happen, trying to manage these concepts um, side by side in this context. So basic concerns is when this entanglement happens, um, it distorts both understandings of what we're talking about, 
uh, when we're talking about race within a frame of diversity. Um, it tends to reify race as genetic in very problematic ways and distract uh, uh, attention uh, from larger structural issues um, of racism. Uh, so um, what I try to do, I go back to start in the 1970s and sort of trace what I, I think of as this kind of dance of entanglement of these terms around each other over time, where sometimes they become very tightly intermeshed and, and, and uh, with each other in ways that, that are very distorting. Um, and, but sometimes they are held in sort of productive juxtaposition where people kind of know what they're talking about. Like it's possible to talk about race in social terms and biological terms and, or diversity, I should say, in social terms and biological terms in ways that don't um, uh, drive this entanglement. And, um, and I think about what sort of forces and incentives are driving or impeding this entanglement. Um, so um, the origin point I go back to uh, is more of a, um, it's a, a, a sort of uh, a, a, a coincidence rather than an actual um, uh, coincidence, I guess, um, but it's a nice place to start, is two of the really framing um, documents that have shaped profoundly how subsequent discussions of biological diversity, and legal diversity um, uh, have occurred in the last 50 years really originated uh, basically around the same time, just across the river. So you have Richard Lewontin, um, who uh, is uh, or was a sort of very eminent um, uh, bi evolutionary biologist, uh, wrote in 1972 an, uh, an article called The Apportionment of Human Diversity which has become one of the most cited, you know, articles in this area ever. Um, and, you know, and it, it, he wasn't, he wasn't necessarily saying something hugely new, but his, this article is the source of when people talk about, oh, there is more genetic variation within a racial group than there are between racial groups. That's this article. When people talk about, you know, race, and people have been talking about race as a social construction uh, as sort of non-biological, you know, before this, but this was really a foundational way of framing and understanding that. So he's talking about the nature of human diversity in the early, in 1972. He comes to Harvard in 1973. Uh, his office is at the, in the Natural Museum of uh, Natural History, uh, just around the corner from Harvard Law School. Um, fall of 1973, Archibald Cox, who's special Watergate prosecutor is fired in October in the Saturday Night Massacre by Richard Nixon, comes back home to Harvard where he had been on the faculty, rejoins the faculty and starts working on a brief on a case called Defunis versus Odegaard in 1973, which becomes, uh, which was uh, sort of the original Bakke versus Regents of the Board of California, the original affirmative action case. Uh, Bakke came out in 1978 uh, but Defunis, which for technical legal reasons was what was called booted out, it never reached a decision on the merits. It was in Defunis that Cox articulated the idea and wrote an extended brief about how diversity in higher education was a compelling interest sufficient to justify the use of race in admissions. And that became the foundation of what became Justice Powell's sort of controlling opinion in Bakke. Uh, talking about diversity as a compelling interest sufficient to sustain affirmative action, which guided and structured uh, uh, the discourse of affirmative action up until Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard last year, mm -hmm. 50 year period. And, and it's really, you know, the reason we talk about diversity in frames of racial justice <laughs> In terms of hiring and all this, the reason there's something called diversity management and diversity equity inclusion is largely because of this brief and largely because of the way the Supreme Court said diversity is the only sustaining reasonable interest. Uh, a lot of issues and problems with that, but that's a, a whole <laughs> discussion. So then just so, so that's sort of the foundational origin point where these, these concepts are originating, you know, within a few hundred yards of each other. Um, and they continue to sort of guide and inform the discourse over the next 50 years. Um, and so just some of the places where I see 
this discourse manifesting and again, sort of either I sort of exploring the way they become entangled or disentangled through deployments by various actors. Um, in the 1980s, you have something called the Heckler Report, Margaret Heckler, who's uh, the uh, um, Secretary of, of uh, Health and Human Services under, uh, 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 under Reagan, uh, actually created the Office of Minority Health and issued a one of the first major reports that led to sort of discussions of what, again, we talk about now as health disparities. Um, and, uh, but talking about the relationship of, again, sort of race to biology and health disparities is, uh, is a site of, again, uh, of great potential entanglement. Um, part of this goes back to the idea of, you know, emerging out of the civil rights movement of the 60s is when you're talking about the need to use race in affirmative action or in voting rights, the danger of sort of reifying race as genetic when you're seeking racial justice in the field of employment or voting or education is not so great. The danger of reifying race as genetic when you're seeking justice, racial justice in the field of biomedicine and health is much greater. Um, and so you also have at that point, but, but the 80s are a time where there's actually relatively little entanglement going on. It's quite interesting the way as these concepts are, are, are emerging. You, are, you also have a, a Supreme Court case in the late 80s, the St. Francis versus Al-Khazrahi, which was actually an interesting sort of vote, again, a, an employment discrimination case about you know, uh, whether or not uh, an Arab American person counted as a racial minority for the purposes of discrimination. They said yes. Um, but there was this, a, 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 a very interesting footnote in the opinion that discussed extensively um, sort of the, the concept of race being social, not genetic. Um, and so the, the sort of Supreme Court was sort of getting it there. It's just an, an interesting little moment. Then in the 90s, you have the emergence of modern genomics. Um, and this is creating all sorts of new driving pressures for the uh, re ray of race in genetic as genetic in very complex ways. And so in the 90s, you have the human, uh, the human genome project should be HGP. The human genome project is getting started. You also have something called the human genome diversity project getting started, taking off, trying to map the world's genetic diversity, again, in ways that became extra, highly problematic and racialized. Um, you have uh, the bell curve coming out, uh, which is one of these direct right wing attempts to sort of uh, connect uh, racial disparities in, uh, in success to genetics. And it was making the argument about, you know, that there are IQ different, you know, genetically based IQ differences among the races. Um, you have a case called Hoffman versus Texas which is actually just striking down diversity. It was, a, it was a circuit court opinion, not Supreme Court, but it did away with affirmative action in, um, in Texas uh, as saying that we're not bound by Baki uh, and uh, saying that diversity is no longer recognized. So you have diversity, so in some cases, diversity coming into the picture, but also some cases it's being squeezed out. Um, but this is also a period where even while, where it's being squeezed out of places like education in Texas, this is really when the concept of diversity management, corporate diversity management is taking off and it's replacing the idea of affirmative action itself with the idea of diversity management. Um, and um, uh, 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 so any, I, I'm going on way too long. Um, so, and so then just to quickly go through then. So, you know, so I'm going through this and then in the early 2000s, you get diversity reaffirmed in the Grutter uh, case for uh, diversity and affirmative action. You have the Human Genome Project being completed. You also have the emergence of these new technologies, these algorithmic technologies, one powerful one called structure, which starts being used in a way that makes it look like race is genetic and it starts getting picked up by people on the right. Uh, again, um, uh, in uh, Charles Murray, one of the co-authors of the Bell Curve in 1994 and 2020 comes out with a book called Human Diversity. And, uh, and it's sort of looking back to structure to say, yes, race really is genetic and making these arguments. And um, uh, you have then this going into the 2010s of these massive genetic databases being, being created. Um, and uh, uh, that, again, are tending much more powerfully towards the reification of races genetic through the bio, through biomedical enterprises. At the same time, you have the rise of the alt-right and Trump. 
and I'm just about done. And then, um, and then you have uh, sort of that brings us up to today, where you have you know this argument about the entanglement again as the alt right and uh, the sort of you know Christopher Rufo's and all of this are engaging with genetics um, and this alt right eugenics and Trump saying you know I have good genes and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> um, and I end with a case study on uh, COVID, which uh, I talked about with the group. So. Wow. An astonishingly rich group of um, suggestive presentations. So this we have about 20 minutes for Q and A. I'm I'm thinking the best strategy is we feel like we're in a living room and our presenters sit where they are and just mm -hmm. are responsive in the moment. Alternatively, I could pull you all up to the front of the room. No, there's no, everybody's comfy now. Yeah. Everybody's comfy. Okay, so I won't hold you all off to the front of the room, and I invite um, uh, questions and comments and thoughts. And, and don't forget to say anything. And thank you, Laura, for reminding me <laughs> that when you speak, please identify yourself. I'll just give a quick comment, Regine Jean Charles. Um, I want to just thank all of you. Um, I think what's great about this format is that when you all do the presentations, you bring things that you didn't necessarily bring into the room when we were talking about your work. And in particular, the images, right, for both Layla and Jeff. Um, my question is, do you plan to have images in the book for Layla and Jeff, you know, the dissertation, I'm assuming you have the images, but I would also encourage you to, when it goes from dissertation to book, to include them if you're not planning on it. I definitely do plan to have some images, but one of the things that I kind of struggled with when I was doing my field work, I did not take a lot of pictures except for a picture of me, um, just because I think there's something emphasizing about the way anthropologists like document everything that way. So I don't have a lot of pictures, but like in the case of um, I always, so both the picture of her and the picture of our Haley Eli are both pictures of them with rifles. And, mm -hmm. and one of the reasons why those two images I think are important to me is because of precisely the way that that quote ended with Layla is that there are all of these multifaceted ways in which women bring themselves into the struggle. And there's one that I didn't talk about, but there is a documentary about Eritrean women um, who, fought in the Eritrean liberation struggle. And one of the things that's very interesting about that group of women is that when you listen to their interviews, one of the things that they say is like getting pregnant was like the ultimate betrayal of their comrades at that time because they were supposed to be in battle mm -hmm. fighting. But then what happens later on in life, even as they're celebrated figures of Eritrean independence and liberation, they then, because they did not have children, because they did not have partners, they don't occupy the position of women in society. And so as they age, they are actually like, they are kind of like stationless people mm -hmm. because they don't have children to take care of them necessarily. And so as much as they're venerated for their, for their fight as warriors in, a, in the battle for liberation, in everyday society, those, those kinds of changes didn't take root in a way that created a kind of socialized way for them to be cared for at, towards the ends of their lives. And so the, a lot of the women have a lot of regrets about the ones who had children have regrets, the ones who didn't have children have regrets because the ones who had children had to leave and they felt like that was them leaving their comrades on the line to die. The ones who didn't obviously their position as women is sort of challenged in society. So for me, I think it is interesting to have these very stark images. We think about women as mothers, we think about women as caregivers, but also as warriors, as intellectuals, as thinkers, as all those things. That also reminds me of Audrey Lord. Mm -hmm. Um it's my use of images sort of varies by chapter. Um a lot of it the first and second chapter are mostly written documents is like the majority of the sources, but the third chapter that I'm just starting to work on, a, a big part of it, not the entire thing, but a big part of it is, is looking at these different advertisements from automakers. Um, and so there will be a lot of images in there for sure. And one of the things that's in particular that you can notice is that over the 
1940s through to the 1960s. Many of those advertisements go from like to like very smiling police officers, like very friendly and approachable in a car to, uh, I'm thinking particularly of this one ad we were talking about it this morning of a, of a Pontiac police cruiser. And it looks like the cover of a, like a horror movie poster mm -hmm. with like the car coming at you and it's like the enforcer. And so mm -hmm. the advertising becomes increasingly sort of, um, I, I guess militaristic is probably mm -hmm. the right way to describe it. Yeah. yeah. Jeffrey, I wanted to ask you about the, um, I, I, I'm sure you said this, but I missed it. So what's your view on putting police back on foot patrols? <laughs> yeah. So a, a lot of things. Um, it, my view is basically that police reforms that center on technologies as solutions or as problems I uh, tend to obfuscate, I never know if I say that yeah, word correctly, beautiful. Um, actual issues, in police, like, the, like the true underlying problems in law enforcement. Um, and they do so in a way that usually expands budget um, and expands power of institutions because you increase training programs, you increase the amount of technology they're using, et cetera. Um, so I sort of skirt the question, to be honest, because I, I, I don't think that it's entirely... I don't think that's ridiculous to say that a police officer on foot might be, you know, less abusive or more connected or whatever to the community. But my argument is essentially that for reformers, it's not actually the point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Laura. Um, Laura Green, uh, English Women's Studies, Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, and Dean's Office. Uh, okay, now I have three things I want to say. One is, <laughs> I think you should make a stronger argument. Like. I actually think you should say you do not care whether police are in cars or on foot, that sure. that's not the issue with police. Um, Cause that's, it seems to, I mean, that seems to me kind of what you're saying. Um, and I don't know that you have to palliate the, our sort of instinctive belief that people on foot are less threatening than people in cars or something, or they're more connected. I don't know. Anyway, that's just my thought. I also, um, following up on Regine's question, I mean, there could be like a whole cultural studies chapter of your dissertation. And I thought particularly of the show, very short running show called Car 54, Where Are You? And I was yeah. wondering, I mean, that seems like that. designed for your dissertation. I was wondering if it makes an appearance. Um, but my you brother, date yourself. <laughs> I, I want to say I'm not old enough to have actually watched it. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But my question for sort of anybody in the group was, I was noticing, it so happens that all three of these presentations sort of imply that in order to do world making, right, to think about future worlds, like a Pan-African socialist world or a world with um, some different kind of policing, um, or, um, you know, a world in which we are able to unentangle um, the questions around quote unquote diversity, that they're all very historical, right? All of these presentations. And then I was trying to remember, I just, this is because I am almost old enough to remember Car 54, where are you? I'm not able right now to call to mind the exact content of the first set of presentations, but I'm just wondering if anyone has comments about that connection between world making looking toward the future and your projects sort of drawing on past or things or historical mm -hmm. I mean I was also sort of thinking of Afrofuturism which mm -hmm. I don't know a lot about but my sense is that maybe it looks less toward history so just a set of questions about about the past and world making I don't know that Afrofuturism looks less towards the past. I think that I think one of the kind of central tenets of of I think Black studies generally, but Af but I think even Afrofuturism, even though it doesn't always come across very clearly, is that we are drawing from and learning from a past in order to improve upon it, um, <clears throat> in order to perhaps not make some of the same mistakes, in order to know learn about the things that actually we're actually working okay. Mm -hmm. And so like for me, one of the reasons why, so this iteration of what I presented to you all is historical, but then the project brings in much more contemporary um, uh, 
inter, uh, what do you call it? Ethnographic data, interviews, meetings, all of those things. Um, but I do think that for me, there is there is a parody. There's a reason why I look at you, the Africa and Venezuela, and Africa continentally, and sort of Venezuela under the sort of Bolivarian alliance of our Americas, is because there are these moments where the, there are these attempts at these pan-continental uh, movements that are that have a success. Like one of the reasons um, when you look at the early independence era African continent, like all of these presidents are gaining independence and they're creating the organization of African unity. Um, and there is a sort of different orientation toward, this is sort of out of the, the Bandung era, out of the tricontinental era, like out of the sort of not line movements. Um, and I do think that there was, there are things to have learned from that. Like some of the things, so Guinea, Ghana, and Mali had an alliance, which is the reason why when Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown, if Seiko Ture invites him to Guinea to be his co-president, right? And that's something that is otherwise really kind of unheard of. <clears throat> And so one of the things Nkrumah always said was that the independence of Ghana means nothing without the independence of Africa as a whole. And, and I believe that that same ethos existed with the Cuban revolution sort of at the helm of the Latin American movement and then Venezuela for a time to their interesting, you know, ups and downs, ins and outs. But I think that there are moments that we actually need not forget about, need not ignore. And there are elements of those things, right? Like some of those things, there was an attempt at that time to build a united currency for people to be able to move across borders to end intellectual property rights because there's an understanding that in order to have a population of people who are willing to fight for the revolution, information has to be accessible and affordable. So I think there are many things to learn from that, but I also think that there are ways in which these newer organizations are taking from those things and creating them in a way that they are more relevant to the time, but not necessarily completely divorced from them. Um, so I don't know if you, so I'll just stay on world making. Um, one of the things that I've, among carceral studies folks and in sort of popular discourse, I think that there's a, a really severe misunderstanding of what police reform actually is. Um, and that reform in the context of law enforcement does not actually look like the same thing as like reforming a university or you know, reform in other contexts. And it's actually taken on like a very particular meaning and that there's a discrete project that is police reform and how to understand it exactly, I think is really necessary because it's, it speaks directly to uh, the question of what to do about problems in policing. Um, and it, the thing that comes up for me is that the project of police reform is really about the constant remaking of a world that is mm -hmm. in which people consider themselves in a constant state of precarity um, and that there is a threat at all times. The reformers about whom I write are deeply, deeply cynical about human nature mm -hmm. um, and about the need for a constant police presence. The guy that I was talking about, Orlando Winfield Wilson, he talked about, we wouldn't actually need police cars if we just had enough officers to, and this, these are his words, put a man at, put an officer at the elbow of every man. Right. And so like oh. they, they really want, uh, you know, okay. like that, it's not quite what I think. Of. Yeah. And so <laughs> like that's sort of what I'm getting at. Like it's a little bit more of a cynical perspective on or, or sort of the negative view on world making because it's this sort of world making. But I think that it's really important to unpack it in order to have these more um, optimistic versions of world making and what you could the world could look like where you're not reliant on an officer at the elbow of every man. Also, interesting. I'm thinking about if anyone is here and would like to apply for our next set of fellows. Mm -hmm. The theme is erasure, and this was one of the things that came up. Our when deadline we is closed. actually closed. Yeah. Uh -huh. we it, when we were thinking problem. about the theme, when we were discussing the theme, and we were talking about, you know, is are there only negative? iterations of erasure mm -hmm. are there times when erasure is positive and i think what our group of fellows has demonstrated i'm thinking also sarah of your presentation from earlier from last week um which you all will see on april 15th um uh that they're negative iterations right of world making that world mm -hmm. making is not always and i i i i have appreciated that intellectual exercise particularly because so much of my thinking about world making is informed by the abolitionist perspective, the black feminist perspective, right? Which is about, you know, building new worlds um, in ways that are generative, that are life-giving, right? That are productive, so. 
the dystopic is also there. Yeah, it's there. Did you want to speak to yeah, that? Well, I guess, I mean, so for me, in some ways, it's in terms of the sort of the history and world making, it's thinking about how, how the concept of diversity is not just descriptive, it's productive. Mm -hmm. And the way you use and deploy it produces particular understandings and valuations of sort of like what counts and what doesn't, what gets seen, what, what gets erased. Um, you know, that, um, that the embrace of diversity to begin with, right, it, uh, sort of legal diversity to begin with in Baki was about, was actually about erasing the past. Mm -hmm. It was about saying, you know, diversity is not about reparations, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, um, but also diversity, the flip side is in the biomedical realm, the concept of diversity has been deployed in this way where it's about sort of like your, your genetic ancestry becomes a stand in for diversity, but genetic, you know, but it produces these understandings of genetic ancestry get sort of classified and constructed in ways that become continental ancestry that then just collapse back into racial groups. And so, you know, things like 23andMe or whatever these ancestry tracing services produce or reproduce, right? These new understand, these newly sort of scientized or biologized understandings of identity um, in a way that then gets sort of, again, sort of entangled with and unfolded in with, because people start using genetic tests to try to get affirmative action mm -hmm. preference in, you know, in admissions or business enterprises. And so, I'll always step into a breach, so, you know. <laughs> so do you think those testing services are insidious? Oh, yeah. That, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, that was so Well, 23andMe is facing bankruptcy. It's very exciting. Um, <laughs> speak, I, was, I was emailing with some people, and I said, is there a schadenfreude or emoji? But, um, uh, but, you know, I mean, but, you know, but they're not only insidious. I mean, oh, I'm sorry, 23andMe was very <laughs> Um, but um, yeah, I mean, they're not only insidious, um, but, um, uh, uh, but they are, but, you know, I mean, you know, they're, they're very dangerous and, you know, which again, you know, lots of things are dangerous and aren't necessarily bad, um, but they are, they're often misused. Um, and, um, you know, they, the companies have gotten a lot better at doing at characterizing their kind of work from the way they did when they got started 15, 20 years ago. Um, uh, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, you have, you know, I don't know if you've seen like these articles a few years ago, it was a big thing again around the time of Charlotte, the, you know, the Charlottesville March. And, you know, you had, you know, white um, supremacists chugging milk because it was a way of proving that they were sort of like genetically white because they, they were not so tolerant, right? And, you know, and, okay. and, you know, and there, be as charged, you know, right? You know, and there, there's been some some great work published uh, by a particular guy named Aaron Panofsky at UCLA doing work on, you know, what happens when white supremacists take these tests and find out that they're not pure white, right? right? And, you know, and so... <laughs> um, you know, there's this whole culture around that. I think we have time for one or two more. If you... <laughs> we exhausted our curiosity. <laughs> oh, we could never exhaust our and curiosity. And Apple actually thinks we're we're at twelve fifty nine. Uh, oh, oh Apple does. I was looking I remember here. Uta making that clock slow. I'm oh. just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm joking. It's like, <laughs> I, 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 I really I think these these are fabulous. <laughs> all have been just oh. fabulous and provocative and um really suggestive. I do want to encourage you all to come back and have lunch with us on March 11th with Chris Manjabra, um, who was new to our faculty. I think we're very excited to have him here. Um, and uh, so please mark your calendars. I also um, want to thank our presenters and thank Regine who does um, convening, convening that group and making it all happen. And I also especially want to uh, thank Abhishek Seha. Yes.
quietly in the background makes us feel secure. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. Well. There's still so more secure. Secure. I have some things going on in my voice with you. Okay. <laughs> That's horribly wrong. <laughs>